Today we're gonna to be talking about exhaust back pressure and the basics of what is known as engine scavenging. Now, the concept of exhaust back pressure itself is fairly intuitive. If you're applying something in the exhaust that puts a resistance in the flow of the exhaust and back on the engine, that is providing back pressure. So say we put on a more restrictive muffler, we're increasing the back pressure at the engine. Now there's two main types of back pressure that we need to consider. Um, one is in the naturally aspirated case where we have our um, back pressure just going down to the cylinder sort of thing. And the other one is in the turbo case where there's two different back pressures. One is the back pressure going to the cylinders and one is the back pressure going to the turbo, so the post turbine pressure. And in one of my earlier videos, I mentioned that you need to have back pressure. And perhaps that's a bit of a misnomer. What I more meant was that back pressure is an inevitable consequence of trying to get your engine to perform better. But that's really under the category of scavenging and I'll go into that more later in the video. To start off with, let's keep it simple and go on the naturally aspirated case. So what I've drawn for you here today is a basic representation of a naturally aspirated engine. We have its two cylinder engine just because I wanted multiple cylinders but didn't want to go really complex on the drawing. We have air filter, throttle body, intake plenum going into the two cylinders, exhaust valve going out down into a collector and down into the full exhaust with the muffler down here. Now of course increasing our back pressure would be caused by making a more restrictive muffler here so if we had like more baffles in it to keep the noise down or if we had a catalytic converter up there those would all increase the back pressure through the system. Now when it comes to naturally aspirated engines one of the key things is trying to get the exhaust out of the cylinder so we can get a fresh charge in. So, so if you imagine our regular four stroke cycle we pull our intake air in, we do our combustion, and then we push out our exhaust gases out. Now when we're hitting our exhaust stroke and trying to get the exhaust out, the piston's gonna be moving up, and then this valve will be open, and exhaust gas will start to flow out. Now the reason that the air flows out of it is because there's a pressure differential, okay? The pressure is higher in here than it is over here, so the air starts to move. That's what causes the air to accelerate out of the piston. Now the more we increase this pressure here, directly the pressure at the valve, the more we end up with the exhaust gas not wanting to leave. Now of course air in an engine system is a compressible fluid, so if we don't end up with all our air leaving, it will basically just stay in here and compress more as we move our cylinder upwards. So after our exhaust valve close, we still end up with a little bit of residual exhaust gas. And this is where the concept of valve overlap sort of comes in, because valve overlap is basically you open the intake and the exhaust valves are slightly open at the same time. So we have our fresh air coming in from here and it helps with us cycling out our exhaust air. Now the key things to take away from that are is that the higher pressure we end up with here, the more it's going to stop fresh air getting in and the more it's going to leave exhaust gas in the cylinder. Now this has two main effects. One is that the effective volumetric efficiency of your entire engine system is dropping because you aren't getting as much air in on the intake charge. Now that's generally bad because that means we dump less fuel, we make less power. The next thing is, is that you're ending up with unburnt gases still in the cylinder. Now this means you have less oxygen available, so you now actually have a physically smaller region. Now those, while they may sound similar, they're two slightly different reasons. So the fundamental gist you should get from that is, is that we want our back pressure here to be as low as physically possible at all times possible. However, in reality, when you're trying to hit peak power somewhere, that's not actually the case, and I'll explain why. Our exhaust system is more complicated than just a steady state system. It's a transient system. We get exhaust pulses running down. Um, and on a, a regular sort of car with sort of a log manifold or something like that, there's not too much we really do with that. But on a properly designed car with tuned length exhaust, what we end up with is pressure wave scavenging. So basically, if you imagine, we have our exhaust pulse comes down here. When it hits this area here, you can see at this sort of throat of these pipes that we're ending up with a large change in area. Now what this does is that this uh, pulse tries to expand out through here, and this actually creates a rarefaction wave and a pressure wave that go back up the pipe. So basically it's rapid expansion causes a shock wave of sorts, not an actual shock wave, to form behind it, which then travels back up the pipe and goes back to the back end of the valve. Now this wave is comprised of two parts basically. If you imagine the wave going along, we have 
a uh, density part and that part. So basically, if you imagine this is the density of the air, um, one part is going to be a compression bit and one part's going to be a rarefaction. Now, I can't remember exactly which way around it is, but basically the idea is, is that you want your rarefaction bit, to, which is basically your region of low pressure and low density, to hit the back of the exhaust valve when the exhaust valve is open. So if you imagine the exhaust pressure wave from the previous cycle hits the back end of the exhaust valve when it opens, that makes this a really low pressure up here, which means that it sucks harder up there. You get the better volumetric efficiency and all that stuff I was talking about earlier. So this is how pressure wave scavenging basically works. We can see that I've decreased the back pressure by doing this, but there's a problem. This tune length only works for a given RPM. So unless you're using variable length exhaust runners, which some guys do by doing switching and stuff like that, you are going to end up with a certain RPM that this works because as the engine frequency changes, the wave propagation speed, it does change a little bit depending on the conditions, but basically depending on your throttle position, which controls the density in here, and the engine speed, you end up with a certain wave speed. Now that means that as the engine speed goes up, your tune length runner is now going to deliver the pulse at a different point in time. So you'll end up with a compression pulse on the backside of here, which means the pressure will actually go up and you'll get worse scavenging than you previously had. So what's the consequence of that? Basically, if you have your tune length exhaust runners, your torque curve is gonna be optimized for a more specific point. So if we imagine our torque curve here, let's say with a non-tuned runner length, we're normally running a torque curve like this, our tuned runner length will instead change out to something more like that. So we can see we've ended up with this being our frequency, well, our RPM that we've tuned for, and that gives us a torque boost there at the cost of stealing torque elsewhere because we have better scavenging where we wanted it and worse scavenging where we perhaps didn't care about it so much. And this is what I was talking about with the back pressure being the inevitable consequence of trying to get more power is that you will end up with basically no back pressure at some particular points, but the consequence of that is higher back pressure at other points. So you do need to have back pressure, it's just a consequence of what happens, but it changes on what revs you're at. Now of course once you're in the collector, the different pulses will interact. So you can end up with the pulse from this cylinder here, you can use that to draw along the pulse from here and get a, a basically a suction effect from the other cylinders, and that can further help your scavenging up there. But again, this will only work for certain rev ranges. So why do people say that increasing back pressure can help your car's drivability, or removing back pressure on my car ruined my car by having a straight uh, muffler? Well, basically, this tuned effect that I was talking about, the more you increase the back pressure in this system here, the more you sort of normalize this expansion region. So if this region here is at high pressure, you're not gonna end up with as strong a wave, a strong scavenging wave going back upstream. So the higher pressure this is here, the less the effect is of the pressure pulses in the actual collector. And what that means is that you move more towards that black curve than the blue curve, which is going to make the car feel a little more drivable. And also, if you haven't tuned the stock ECU to compensate for the new volumetric efficiencies, then you are going to end up with kind of screwing with your car if you've changed your back pressure, which is why most people seem to think that removing back pressure makes things bad. Whereas in actual fact, if you've compensated for it correctly and designed your system correctly, it's always a good thing. Take a look at drag cars, they make 8,000 horsepower and their headers go straight to the atmosphere, which would have an incredibly strong scavenging pulse. Now, when it comes to turbo cars, it's a little bit different with what we're dealing with. Scavenging, not so much of a thing on turbo cars because we've got quite a significant positive pressure here. So this is our compressor side, air goes through here, still the same sort of engine there, then we've got our turbine here, and then we go out there. So our pressure pulses um, are basically gonna be negated by the fact that we've got so much boost that we're not using those solely to get the air out. We can use them to help, but turbo cars inherently have back pressure because at the turbine here, there's pressure, right? you're using that pressure difference. So turbines use a combination of heat differential and pressure differential to get the energy to run the compressor, right? So the pressure here is gonna be higher than ambient. Now this means that there's gonna be back pressure here. Your scavenging is not gonna work quite as well. And a lot of the theory behind exhaust um, pre-turbine design is to try and improve turbo spool. So you can end up with trying to time the pulses to all arrive at the same time. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that here because I think we're getting outside the scope of this video. But the fundamental thing is, is that scavenging isn't as important, 
But what is an interesting thing for turbo cars is the post turbine exhaust pressure. Now I mentioned before that the turbine is driven by a combination of heat and pressure differential. Okay. Now people think that there's no heat involved in a turbine, measure your temperature before and after a turbine or have a look at some basic equations on how gas turbines work. You'll see that there is a heat drop across them. But anyway, if we lower our post turbine pressure, we are ending up with a larger pressure differential across the turbine here. What does that mean? Our turbine is now going to extract more work and we haven't increased the pressure here. So we're not increasing the back pressure of the engine and ruining its scavenging and ruining its volumetric efficiency. Instead, we've just basically gotten free energy. So basically on the backside of a turbo car, you want to try and decrease the pressure as much as possible. Anyway, that's the basics of exhaust back pressure and scavenging. I couldn't quite discuss everything. So if you think I've missed something, feel free to leave a comment below. Um, and hopefully this cleared up a few things for a few viewers. And if you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that like button. Check out my other videos on my channel and hit that subscribe. And hopefully I'll see you next time.